we'll get started in maybe two minutes just to allow a bunch of other yeah. attendees to sneak in. I'll give the next couple of minutes. Yeah. Yeah, Quark has been great to help us with the recordings and getting them up on the pop bus. So it's nice to have that as well. Agreed. Yeah. morning to all the attendees that are starting to log in. We'll wait, we'll wait one or two more minutes um, before we get started. We're excited to have Professor Dr. Dole Tepper with us. We want to make sure we give her lots of time to chat. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> That's it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love interaction. Good. You want questions? We got questions. <laughs> sure. I'm sure, Barry. <laughs> well, let's get started. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending today. And uh, thank you to those who have participated in the past and being uh, regular attendees um, of the Stedward Talks. This is our Fourth, yeah, our fourth Stedward talk. And this evolved uh, through a conversation between um, Eli Wolf, Mary Hums, uh, Ted Fay, and myself. And it became a coordinated uh, effort between disability and sport. Um, so, an organization that Eli and Mary and Ted helped found. And IFAPA, the International Federation of Adapted Physical Activity, of which Gudrun, our speaker for today, um, is a past president. And what we wanted to do was to allow an opportunity uh, to focus on the past uh, to better understand the future. So perhaps um, an analogy to Malcolm Gladwell's revisionist history um, podcasts. And both Eli and I had a particular fondness for uh, Dr. Robert Stedward, um, who was my supervisor uh, during my PhD at the University of Alberta. And so we decided to uh, name them the Stedward Talks. And our first speaker was Dr. Robert Stedward, who talked about the history of the Paralympic movement. We also, the four of us that I mentioned earlier, wanted these talks to focus on inclusion and particularly the intersection between uh, the Paralympic movement and the Olympic movement or the able-bodied system and the sport for disability systems. And so for instance, in our most recent Stedward talk, we looked at the history of inclusion within the Commonwealth Games um, and talked about how inclusion might work in the future within that games. So without further ado, um, I'm going to now pass, oh, and I should mention also, for those of you that are interested, uh, we do record these sessions and they're available on the IFAPA website, ifapa.net, um, and you're able to access all of our archives of the four Stedward talks and the ones moving forward on that website at your leisure. I will also suggest um, that we really encourage you to participate in this session, uh, ask questions, make comments, and certainly use the chat function uh, for that purpose. And both Mary uh, Humes and I will be moderating, and so we'll try our very best to ensure that the questions that are posed in the chat function um, are, are relayed to Gudrun and that we're able to uh, have those conversations. What I'm gonna do now is ask my, again, supervisor uh, and mentor, Dr. Robert Stedward, founding president of the International Paralympic Committee and Professor Emeritus, I used to think it was Emeritus, uh, Professor Emeritus at the ah. University of Alberta in Canada to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Gudrun, Professor Dr. Gudrun Doltever. Dr. Stedward, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, David, and, and good morning, everyone, to all our friends and colleagues who are 
uh, chimed into this uh, great session today. Uh, I mean, it's very special for me to be able to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Gudrun Dahltepper, who's uh, not only an outstanding uh, leader in the field of adapted physical activity and Olympics, uh, but she's also a very uh, dear friend that we've known each other for, for many, many years. Uh, in fact, I think the first time that I was able to participate in, in activities in uh, Berlin was, I think, back in 1989, Gudrun, at the uh, FAPR Congress organized by Gudrun and her students. But uh, Gudrun is a, a professor in the uh, educational science and psychology faculty at the Free University of Berlin. Uh, she's been uh, a wealth of leadership uh, throughout many years of her career uh, in the area of inclusion, in the area of uh, physical activity and disability, in the area of women in leadership positions and the like. And so she's uh, been able to really provide the kind of leadership uh, that's necessary to move the whole area of women in sport as well as disability in sport to the next level. Uh, it would be really nice if we could clone another 10 or 15 Gudrun Dahlteppers to uh, further uh, make this uh, successful. Uh, Gudrun has served on and led many, many countries, uh, organizations in her own country of Germany, uh, dealing with disability, dealing with the Olympics, uh, Olympic education, uh, et cetera. Uh, and in fact, she, I believe she currently still serves on two uh, international Olympic committee commissions in the Olympic education and certainly uh, women in sport. And along all of her history of leadership over the number of years, she has been recognized and honored with uh, two honorary Doctor of Laws degree, uh, one in Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland in Canada, and the second one <clears throat> at the uh, Catholic University in uh, Leuven in uh, Belgium uh, because of her outstanding worldwide contribution. And I think one of the uh, significant uh, achievements uh, from my perspective uh, as well is that she was recognized by receiving the uh, Paralympic Order from the International Paralympic Committee. So without further ado, it gives, it's, it's an honor, it's a privilege to recognize and to introduce my really great personal friend, Professor Dr. Gudrun Dahltepper. Gudrun. Hello, and uh, I'm very excited to be part of the uh, Stedwer Talks and a uh, very warm welcome to all of you who are with me here. Uh, for me, this is uh, afternoon. I know for some of you it's uh, early morning. So wherever you are, um, I'm really excited uh, to make a contribution to the Stedwer Talks and Thank you so much, uh, Robert Stedward, for your introduction. I was a little bit afraid it would take longer. Um, <laughs> I was tempted. But, uh, it's the, it leaves something uh, still for me uh, to add to yeah. to what you have just said. He was um, under he was under strict he was under strict uh, rules to not. Uh, to okay, up. okay, good. <laughs> I'm I'm very glad. So, so now I know, um, Doctor Stedward, you need to leave. Um, at eight, at eight thirty our time, yes, uh, in Western Canada. So uh, thank you very much for attending, and I know you'll have to slip out in a few minutes. Um, yeah. Gudrun, am I able to ask right away the very first question? Are you are you ready? Sure. ready yes, sure. Question? Yes. So so Dr. Stedward made reference to you being uh, president of Ixpe and also IFAPA, and clearly you've been around the Olympic and the Paralympic movements a lot during your career. Um, and as, as I as I spoke about in the in the initial introduction, part of the uh, motivation for this was talking about the intersection um, between the Olympic and the Paralympic <clears throat> movements and bridging sport and physical activity for people with disabilities within the Olympic and Paralympic movements. And so, what I'm wanting you to to talk about initially is your roles with Ixpe and IFAPA, um, because I would suspect that they provided a unique perspective and 
you know, a, a different lens um, for facilitating the progress of disability inclusion uh, within the Olympic and Paralympic domains. If you could just kind of comment on those two particular roles and then the aspect of inclusion for persons with disability, I'd love that for the, that, that to be kind of the starting point for our conversation. Yeah, of course. Um, but I think I have to start uh, a little bit earlier than being president of organizations. Um, during my, my time at university, when I was a physical education student, I already worked with children with disabilities. And um, I think it was in my second semester that I started to work in a rehabilitation center here in Berlin with children with cerebral palsy. And then I also got the opportunity to be a physical education teacher in a special school at times when we had special schools for children with learning disabilities and intellectual disabilities. And I did this for 10 years. And it kind of out of curiosity, I wanted to learn more about that. And that of course um, led me to, to travel to other countries, uh, to go to Brussels uh, in Belgium and to, to see what other countries were doing in this particular field. And from today's perspective, I must say that I was really lucky that I had this practical experience first, mm -hmm. and then I also tried to expand into international networks and to European networks. And I think that these days in the, in the 1960s and in the 1970s were really, um, there were times like um, brilliant for pioneers in this field because there were so few. Um, mm -hmm. we, we tried to identify areas uh, of common interest, but sometimes we were just five people from five different European countries. And so, um, uh, and when I came first time to an uh, adapted conference that was in New Orleans in 1981, I met Eunice Kennedy Shriver, for example, and she invited me to another event of Special Olympics. So in 1983, I was in Baton Rouge for the Special Olympics Games. And can you imagine, and now in 2023, Berlin will be the host of the World Summer Games of Special Olympics. And I was on the bid committee. So it all kind of shows that it was curiosity. It was the networks that were at that time very, very small. And I came to um, New Orleans and I thought, wow, this is a great conference, IFAPA. And I was asked to be on the board of directors. I had never heard of Robert's Rules of Order or anything, so I was surprised when they had their meetings that they moved emotions, I understood, or they second something. I thought second, third, fourth, or what is going on here? I talked to the president at that time and he said, is that possible? You do not know Robert's rules of order. Now you can look into my library. I have them all. But <laughs> any, anyway, it was really um, the time when I also had um, excellent uh, students like Harald von, Harald von Seltsam or Heike Trischmann. And I had students who were so enthusiastic that I was really um, um, encouraged to put forward a bid to host the seventh International Symposium of Adapted Physical Activity in Berlin in June 1989, just a few weeks or months before the wall came down. But we had more than 800 participants and Dr. Stedward was one of the keynote speakers. We had Phil Craven to be um, with Horst Strohkendel in a workshop on uh, wheelchair basketball. So I think it was really a time when we, um, uh, had to look for other people who were moving towards something. Um, maybe we did not use the term inclusion at that time that much as we do today, but this was our idea. And um, I, I think that um, it was a great time also to start new study programs, with, which we did in Leuven, for example, Erasmus projects, um, the, a program that existed over many years and later became even an Erasmus Mundus program uh, from 2005 to 2015. And um, as a member of the sport of IFAPA, I represented IFAPA in XP board meetings. That was the connection. So uh, when we had meetings um, in different parts of the world, I was there to report to the IFAPA Board later what had happened in XP. And it gave me the great uh, opportunity to meet 
presidents and um, secretary generals of other organizations in the field of physical education, sports, sports science. And um, I will never forget uh, the day when I was at the General Assembly of uh, XP in October 1990, when a new president was um, uh, had to be elected. And there were two candidates and uh, Paovo Komi came out as a president. And um, the following years, um, I was, uh, of course, uh, with this uh, IFABA board, but I was also with XP. It was kind of a close connection. And then in September, Dr. Stedward in 1989, on the 22nd of September uh, in Düsseldorf, was elected president of IPC. And so I think that was also a great um, moment because we could connect the representatives of the physical education area and also sports science people and the IPC. And um, I also uh, remember that we had uh, a Paralympic Congress in uh, 1992 uh, on the occasion of the Paralympic Winter Games in France. And Dr. Sedward and I, we discussed that there should be a connection being made between the researchers, the practitioners, the athletes, and uh, this idea, which really became reality in, in uh, 1993 at the VISTA conference, that I think was also another kind of milestone event, which continues to exist, maybe in a different way, but it clearly shows that um, there was, um, um, I think, um, great, um, great moments that um, people um, brought together and moved forward to maybe to, the, to a next level. We would, would never know exactly what that would mean, but we had great optimism, great enthusiasm, and uh, I'm, I'm very thankful for what I have uh, experienced during these days, which of course also have an impact on what I'm doing today, for example, as a vice president of the German Olympic Sports Confederation. Gudrun, before we move on to our next question, it's interesting, I'm just looking at the attendees. I think there's a number of former students from the Erasmus Mundus uh, program that are attending mm -hmm. today. A, can you maybe just talk a little bit about what that program is? Because some people may not know what it is. And the second thing, and I'm a remiss at this, even explaining what ICSPE is, um, there may be some people here who aren't even familiar with what that organization is. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, of course, I'm glad, glad if there are former students um, attending. That is, this is wonderful. Um, I think the, uh, the idea to start such a program was that adapted physical activity as, uh, as an area of expertise, uh, bridging practice and theory, etc., was not very well known in Europe, in European countries. And that was the main reason why we presented this to, to uh, the European um, um, Commission, and we asked for permission to get, uh, of course, also financial support to start this program. And that was uh, 10th of July, 1990, if I remember right. And uh, um, Professor Van Koppenolle from Leuven University and, and uh, people from the European Commission were present. And uh, we were lucky that we could start this program. And it was something which, of course, as an area was better known in Canada and the United States, but for European um, professors, students, it was quite, um, quite unknown. And I, I remember that when we hosted the uh, International Symposium in Berlin, I had a lot of uh, difficulty in explaining to sponsors, to colleagues in other areas, what adapted physical activity is. And um, this, of course, um, was, was a very important point to um, develop a greater network of experts in the field. I think this was maybe was the main uh, mission of it. XP um, started already uh, in the um, 1950s uh, in this kind of a child of UNESCO, United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. And uh, it started in 58 in Paris. Uh, where the headquarters of UNESCO are. And the idea was also to uh, create a network of people in the air areas of physical education and sport. Still today, UNESCO is a focal point for physical education and sport in the United Nations system, although other 
uh, UN bodies are also dealing with it. Um, and um, it was um, a great um, opportunity for me also to learn more about the area um, of, of physical education and sport as it was seen in other parts of the world. It's a real international network. When I was um, elected uh, in Atlanta in 1996, and my term started in January 1997, um, we kind of um, had big challenges because when I was elected, I, I was um, just one woman on the board. And when I returned back to Berlin and people asked me, what are your plans for the future? I said, we need more diversity. We need more women. We need people with disabilities. We need people with different cultural backgrounds. And they said, yeah, that uh, will take maybe uh, a decade or more. I said, no, it might take maybe two years because this is the next time we have a general assembly and we can change the constitution and the bylaws. And so, uh, but nothing can you can do by yourself. It's always in a team. And I had great people, Anita White, Margaret Talbot. I had so many people that were also uh, pushing forward and, um, when I look back, I think this was, it was a wonderful time. Um, and I'm, I hope that the other people that I have mentioned and those I have not mentioned yet um, have the same um, um, yeah, memories and the same enthusiasm about what has happened at that time. And I want to change tracks just a little bit. And I also want to encourage our attendees to use the <coughs> chat function if they want to uh, participate, contribute to the conversation. I want to uh, now focus a little bit on your role within the Olympic movement. Um, and as Dr. Stedward mentioned, you're currently on two, uh, two commissions, one on education and the other on women. Um, but I want you to talk a little bit about um, your experiences with the evolution of the IOC leadership, uh, going back to Antonio Samaranch, Jacques Rogue, and then presently with, uh, with Thomas Bach. And again, um, what I'm wanting the conversation to focus on is how it relates to the IOC's uh, support and engagement um, related to athletes with a disability. And again, you can even speak to, if you wish, the exhibition events, which would have started, I think, in uh, Sarajevo and then in Los Angeles in 1984. And again, I know that you were involved, um, if not directly, but certainly indirectly, even going back as far as that. Yeah, I think that's uh, um, it's a very interesting question. What uh, kind of role um, and perspective did um, previous or current, uh, the current president of the IOC have on, on sport for people with disabilities? But what I remember very well was that in the, the early 1980s, there were separate organizations um, for people with disabilities. Of course, uh, wheelchair um, sport, but then also blind sport and uh, CP sport, etc. So I remember that uh, uh, when I had meetings with uh, Mr. Samaranch uh, later, he uh, also uh, kind of complained that there was no one voice uh, speaking. And, uh, and I think in this respect, um, Samaranch really, um, I think, had uh, quite an impact. Uh, maybe we, we are sometimes not really aware of that, but he also um, asked uh, Rick Hansen uh, in the, in the uh, second half of the 1980s to look into uh, the possibility to have athletes with disabilities participating in the Olympics. And even though um, um, the, the document that Rick Hansen prepared um, was not put into reality, but it was Samaranch who was the initiator of that. And over the time, I've seen um, uh, yeah, different, different um, reactions within the Paralympic movement and the Olympic movement as it relates to either getting closer to each other or rather being more autonomous. And uh, I, um, I was a moderator of a, a session of the IPC in, in Tokyo in 1995, where uh, questions were discussed, should we move more closer to the IOC? And there was maybe half of the participants who said, yeah, that's the way to go. But the other half was just totally opposite to that. And they said, no, this will be the end. We have to stay separate. 
And it, to, to be moderator in a session where you see there are 50% on that side and, and, and almost no one in the middle. They, either you were in favor or you were opposed. And, um, and I know that there were struggles and, and uh, discussions because of the, of the logo of the IPC. Was it too close to the Olympic rings? And you know all that. But in the end, I would say um, Stedward, but Dr. Stedward became a member of the IOC, and that was when Samaranch was IOC president. And, uh, and this was, of course, also um, continued by the next IOC president, uh, Jacques Rogel. And today we have uh, Andrew Parsons being an IOC member, and Dr. Bach is the IOC president. So in, in that respect, I think we see continuity. But we also, I think, see um, differences when we compare the, the IOC presidents. Um, Dr. Bach is someone who is very much uh, has a background not only in law but also in, in marketing and uh, just a few days ago, I think it was on the 22nd of July, um, they signed the contract, the IOC, with uh, Procter & Gamble and this is the first time that uh, the, uh, the Paralympic um, Games and the IPC are included into that. And that's a contract that uh, will um, go for the next uh, eight years, from 2020 to 28. And uh, it's, uh, it go gives global marketing rights. And I think this is really uh, an amazing uh, step. Maybe not a lot of people have already seen that. But, um, um, and the IOC-IPC partnership was signed in, uh, in, uh, in 2018. And it goes until 20. 32. So there, there is really um, a great um, um, cooperation, I would, I would call it cooperation, but um, we focus a lot on the president's role, but I think we have also to see uh, where um, people um, who have a background in, in disability and disability sport are um, um, working on commissions of the IOC. Uh, you have mentioned uh, certain commissions. For example, the uh, Commission on Olympic Education um, was uh, chaired by Philip Craven. So Philip Craven. So uh, the and, and members of the Paralympic movement are on boards and are on commissions of the IOC. And I think this is really also maybe a very inclusive approach. It could be more, yes, but uh, I think we've moved really um, in a in a very good direction over the last years. And I'm sure that the uh, relation between Andrew Parsons and uh, Dr. Bach are also uh, very good. That's what I hear from him. And that's also what I see um, in documents, what I see in contracts. Uh, and um, I, I think this point with the global marketing rights is really, it's uh, really amazing. Yeah, thank you for that response. Mary, I know I'm passing it over to you. I see we have two questions in our chat function. I did this to you the last time though too where I, I talk so much and I got to ask all the questions and then there wasn't any time for you to ask any questions. So I'm, I'm just, I'm hesitant to, to kind of do that. I know Jane and Tara though, and I want to make sure that we get a chance to ask their two questions. Are, are we able to do that? Are you, are you okay if we move to those questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, would you like me to go, oh, I can go ahead and lead right into their questions and read them. Um, well, we, have a couple, we have a couple questions that have come in. One is from Jane Blaine uh, and Jane is wanting to know, with where we have come with inclusion, do you believe there is an undervaluing of adapted physical activity, knowledge, and expertise? And if, and if I can, just to provide a little bit of context, yeah. Gudrun, you talked about um, blind sport being separate from the other disability sport organizations. Jane is the CEO of the Canadian Blind Sport Association and a good friend of mine. Okay. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think that's a great, great question. And thank you for asking me, Jane. Yeah. Um... I think um, it's it's really not that easy to um, um, to make a comment here because um, um, my own um, perspective on um, bringing in more people with disabilities with different kinds of disabilities this is this is my opinion this is this is what I'm doing also with my colleagues um, but I know that it's not always um, seen in the same way by other people. Um, we, we might see uh, people 
uh, and I can I can only report on also what is happening currently uh, with regard to the uh, to Special Olympics, uh, the World Games preparations for 2023. Um, when it when we were um, given this opportunity, we were very excited, but the reactions of some other people are not that positive. So I think it will be an ongoing discussion, and we have to make sure that that. Um, um, the, the, the kind of positive attitude and the um, empowerment that comes from people with disabilities are really given a voice um, and um, and this is I think also it's a it's kind of a responsibility that that we have as people who are in the field who are um, uh, maybe having made other experiences as others uh, I know that also from people who are, are who are deaf they, they feel not valued and not uh, given the opportunity because there is no um, um, uh, sign language or, or, they, or they have not the same opportunity to access information. And if I have not access to information, I can, for example, um, not maybe um, put forward a candidature if I'm not, I'm not aware that there is a possibility. So I think uh, information and communication are really key and we need to work with all the media that we have, social media and all the, uh, and, and our networks so that we can really um, offer more opportunity. And that will also then, um, I think will hopefully continue in the future to bring in more people uh, with different kinds of disabilities also to to be uh, in, in in leadership positions uh, or to be administrators okay thank you for asking that we have another question in the chat here and this one comes from tara chisholm and uh, tara. tara would like to know you, david do you also know tara i also know tara um <laughs> she's just, and again i, I want to provide the context because i think it's important to know these things like, while you're answering the question. And Jane and Tara, certainly if you want to uh, interrupt me and provide more context, you're more than welcome to do that. But Tara is one of the leads of women's sledge hockey in Canada um, and has really been a huge leader in that particular area. And so uh, I, I, just, I just think that's you know, worth, worth knowing when we talk about this idea of gender equity within the game. So Mary, sorry. <laughs> I did this to you the last time too. I'm gonna shut up. I'm gonna stop talking. Not a problem. Uh, uh, I'm glad to hear that Tara is with a women's. You said women's sledge hockey. Uh, um, that's a good connection. There's a, there's actually a small group online of of women who are interested in doing hockey research mm -hmm. on, on on women in hockey. Okay. I I joined in the group because I said um, I'm interested, but I'm only really interested in women's sledge hockey. Well, not, there's not been so much activity. So I guess I need to, I just wrote Tara's name down. So Tara, if you're out there, you might be hearing from me. All right. <laughs> <From all of laughs> um, but and, and so let's get to your question. Uh, and, and Tara wants to know uh, that, you know, Dr. Del Tepper, you talked about more diversity on boards in both the Olympic and Paralympics. Um, there has been statements made about gender equity. Uh, so what do you think would be one or more of the most important next steps to getting closer to gender equity in the games in the games or on the boards uh, well the question reads on in the games um i think that that would be two if you could address two different i actually yeah, had a I think it's, up yeah, for you about it's two different yeah um so if your, you your question mary is going to be about governance yeah. yeah um so how about if we talk about boards and then we talk about participants yeah. um, I think this is this is a topic that uh, we have been discussing for for a long time. Um, as I said earlier, in, in XP we were able to really make a change uh, relatively fast, but some in some um, boards uh, it seems that they are staying on board forever and ever, and therefore I think. Um, Limited terms of office, for example, is something that is really important because uh, some in some areas you will find people, it, 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 maybe they do a good job. I'm, I'm not saying this, but I think we have to um, focus on recruitment. How, how do we identify people, make contact to them or get in contact with them and then uh, also encourage them to, to put forward a candidature? 
um, uh, I've done quite a, a lot of uh, research also with regard to women and uh, their role in, in leadership positions. And we have found that uh, there are women out there who have all the qualifications and all the, um, they, 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 they can do it, but when you do not talk to them directly and you encourage them to be a candidate, they will not do it. And this might also um, be true for, not only for women, but it might also be true for some other people who say, well, um, there, is a, there is a vice president for finances. Uh, uh, he or she is in that position, mainly it's he, in that position for 20 years. I'm sure he will stay for another 20 years. So why should I put forward? That's why I said limited terms of office. I think, I really think that is, that, uh, that is one key. And the other one is a recruitment to really, and encourage people. Yeah? Not everyone from the very first moment has a fighting spirit, but you can develop a fighting spirit. And you also have to bear in mind, it's not only important to get to a certain position, but to stay in that position, create maybe partnerships with others, and then move this organization forward. I mean, no organization can stay the way it is today. It has to develop. And, uh, and that's, uh, I think, something where we need the diverse, uh, a diverse group of people. They can bring the best results. I'm absolutely convinced about that. Uh, thank you. And I have a, a question that is related to diversity as well and inclusion, it sort of extends our conversation. We've been talking about gender. Um, but of course, there's so much going on these days in terms of race. You know, for example, the, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, that's, that's, that's global. Um, so I wonder if you could talk about, since we're talking about inclusion, sort of the intersectionality of disability with race and your thoughts on maybe a Black disabled lives mindset or movement and how we can get more people of color into the disability sport community. I think that, um, as I said, I'm absolutely convinced that a diverse group of people in boards or in organizations can lead really to excellent results. However, I think we have also to bear in mind that the situation might differ from one country or one area, region in the world. For example, in the country where I live, we have a lot of community who has Turkish or Arab backgrounds, and you will not find many of them on our boards. It's not just, uh, let's say, it's not just a question gender, but it's a question if we are really open to bring in people um, who have a different cultural or religious background, maybe also, as you just mentioned, color, but um, we have to also look into that situation. And I'm, I'm, very, um, um, I'm, I'm very excited about this current situation because athletes themselves um, and coaches um, take up this kind of situation and uh, have their voices being heard. I think this is, this is something where the IOC now also, and, and we in, in German Olympic Sports Confederation, we're also discussing what, what um, should be allowed, what kind of um, um, presentation of, uh, of um, opinion or, or uh, can be shown on the occasion of Olympic and Paralympic Games. Um, um, as we see it in, 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 in uh, American football, but that's really, uh, it's an ongoing process, and, but it, it's very dynamic. It's, it's very, very dynamic. I do not know what your perspective is on it, but we follow very closely. And I just had a board meeting of the uh, President's Committee of the German Olympic Sports Confederation two days ago in Cologne in Germany, and that was very, very high on our agenda. How can we have the voices of the athletes being heard? voices of athletes with very, very diverse backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, particularly with, you know, Rule 50, uh, the discussion yes, about 50. what's allowed in terms of a protest, what's allowed of, in, in terms of a statement. And Eli, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that just for a second. No, it's just really great to hear the different perspectives and to thinking that Gudrun, your, all of your perspectives around diversity and the power of a diverse team and how that can lead to success. I think that's amazing to hear that. And I think it 
really speaks loudly. And then I think Mary, the next your question about disability and governance, and I think that that next question, I think that'll be really interesting to hear some thoughts in terms of what can sport administrators do. So I guess I'll turn it back to you, Mary. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah a question that I wanted to ask was. Um, what strategies, specific strategies then, can sport administrators use to try to increase representation by people with disabilities in management level positions? So mm -hmm. uh, as executives, as board members, head coaches even, but in sports organizations, but particularly in governing bodies, how can we get more people with disabilities in, you know, strategically into executive level, decision-making level positions uh, so that they are visible, that we see sport managers with disabilities? Yeah, I think, uh, of course, we are basing um, or we are, we are facing um, that situation um, for, for, for a long time. And um, as I said, um, I think this whole recruitment proce process and we have to maybe make a difference between um, elected positions where I'm running, uh, I'm a candidate, for example, to be president or vice president, or if we're talking about uh, um, the administrative area. Um, that, of course, has something to do in which way I'm uh, announcing this position. I can, I can clearly indicate that uh, certain um, diverse backgrounds are welcome. I can put this already in the announcement. When it comes to, um, to uh, elected positions, then I think the situation, as I said, has a lot to do with the recruitment process. Um, and for example, um, we, um, we have um, in our boards, we have people with, with uh, different backgrounds, but we have people also with a disability, for example, in the German uh, sports, in the Berlin Sports Confederation, vice president um, has a cerebral palsy, but um, um, I think he was not elected because of that, but because of his expertise. And that is the key. The key is the expertise. And as, a, as a, another example, I can share with you that um, since 2010, I'm the chairperson of a working group in the German Olympic Sports Confederation where all the different categories that we have, high performance sport, um, sport for all, youth sport, and so on, and the three disability sport organizations, deaf sport, Paralympic sport, and Special Olympics, they're all sitting around one table and we are creating together ideas and then we bring that forward to government. And we were able three years ago to get funding from the German ministry, the federal ministry of uh, labor and social affairs that we could bring people with disabilities and they had to have a disability into the first uh, market, labor market. Um, and this we called uh, inclusion managers. So they could do different things. They could either be experts in putting um, complex texts into easy to understand language or whatever their expertise was. And uh, they, after the, the, their time uh, that was funded by the government, they were um, later on hired by the sport organization to stay on board. And because of this successful um, program, we are now starting a new one, which is event inclusion managers. Um, we have many sport events uh, on European level, on even international level, and we want more people with a disability to be managers, a part of the management team. But that sometimes also, of course, needs a certain um, training programs, uh, a certain education, and this is what we are currently offering. And I think um, um, talking now to all of you, um, that shows me that we should maybe also make a lot more um, promotion uh, internationally because this is something that worked in one part of the world, but uh, but could maybe also be an example for others. And uh, we would be happy to share our experiences, which are really, really very, very good. I have to say one thing to that. The problem basically was with high level top athletes in this workplace because they were always in training camps etc and so the, the the leaders the administrators sometimes were 
um, a little bit disappointed that they were not really working there uh, every day, but that they had to come from training camps, uh, Canary Islands or something. Um, but with the others, it worked really very well. And um, we're, we're, now we are looking forward to this new program. And as I said, we have the World Games of Special Olympics coming up in, in Berlin in 2023. And this is just an example where these people um, maybe have an opportunity to practice what they have learned in their training programs in reality. Um, I'd like to move to another question from the chat that also deals with inclusion and inclusion within the disability community since disability is not monolithic, uh, but people come in with, you know, they, they bring themselves who they are to, the, to their workspace or their, their sports space. And so a question that we have from Karen Korb, uh, and, uh, and I think the, Eli and David, do you also know Karen? From Lakeshore, yeah. From Lakeshore, yeah. Uh, and Karen asks, how do we influence leaders of disability sport organizations who do not have disabilities to understand and embrace disabilities that are different from physical disabilities? The resistance to include other disabilities other than physical disabilities is palpable and enraging for those of us who want to see inclusion of diverse and intersectional representation of persons with disabilities? Um, I think it's necessary to find out what the reasons for resistance are. Why are people resisting? Is it that they have made some experiences or because they do not have any knowledge about it? We know people who are opposed to something, but they have no, no information. So I think it's maybe important also um, to, um, to identify really what the reasons are. And um, I think this cannot be done uh, like a, a group uh, session. It's something where you really have to talk to people individually. Um, I know that we had people here in Germany who were totally opposed to being the host for the World Games or Special Olympics because they said, we are sport. They have an intellectual disability. They can practice their sport in a, uh, in a special school or maybe they, they can have it in a rehabilitation center. We are the people who are representing sport. But to, to make sure that people really understand that sport also has many faces. Uh, sport is not all competitive sport. Sport can be sport for all, can be recreational, etc. And I think it's really important to be in, in very close contact with sport members, for example, who, who have this kind of resistance. And I always, I'm, I'm, um, I know it's sometimes, um, um, you wished um, all the work that we are doing uh, would have continuous um, success. But this is not the case. We will face always people who have a different opinion. We have to discuss with them. We have to um, argue. Um, and um, this is an ongoing process, but um, I'm not getting tired uh, to be part of that. And I hope that the others are not getting tired too. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you for your answers there. And Eli, I think I'm yes. gonna turn it over to you now to take a few of the questions again from the chat as well. Excellent. Yeah, we're receiving some really great questions coming in. And so David and Mary and I were sort of monitoring and we're, we're going to capture as many. And thank you all online. Please continue to share your questions and comments. And um, there's a great question that came in from Carlos from Australia, um, particularly talking about um, how do we get to inclusion within organizations, within the Paralympics, within the Olympics, within international federations, um, but particularly around this tension between promoting sport excellence versus promoting sport for inclusion. And so how do you see that tension within organizations? Do you see that as a tension? How do you find ways that we can work through that of doing both excellence and inclusion? Um, that's a really interesting question. So Gudrun, yeah. <laughs> I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, Wait, and, and then maybe David wants to add to that. Yeah. Some context, Carlos is a PhD student. Um, okay. Adapted physical activity and sport management, Mary and Eli and Gudrun. Um, so he's based at Griffith University uh, and is going to be 
uh, Graham Cuskily in the management side and Simon Darcy, who's down in Sydney in the disability side are working with them. So again, just some context as to who these people are. It's a great question about sport performance and inclusion and how do we navigate that? So yeah, Gudrun, please. Mm -hmm. to, to me, uh, this is not a contradiction, um, but uh, obviously it is for some people that, is, uh, that it doesn't go uh, along with each other. But I think, um, it, again, we have to, to uh, maybe um, see um, the, um, the, I think that the role of, of, of talents, the role of talent identification um, with people with different, um, um, dis different disabilities and uh, maybe also the, the, the differences that we have in the interest uh, of people of, uh, in, in, in getting into a, a higher performance level. Um, some people have that interest. Uh, Eli, yeah, you have that. Maybe some other people, they would be rather uh, satisfied with, uh, let's say, what we would call maybe a recreational activity. But to me, the two terms, um, sporting excellence and inclusion, they, they do not exclude each other. It, it, it's, 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 to me, it is something that goes along with each other very well. Excellent. Well, thank you. And uh, it's just great that these questions are coming and we can talk about them. There's actually a really excellent question that's coming now from Caitlin. Um, and we can look at, we can maybe go back to ones that's come in earlier as well. But this question that just came in about Olympic education. Um, so Olympic education has been around for a while and OVEP has been the IOC's primarily mechanism. Paralympic education is newer to the scene. The Paralympic school day now exists impossible. How do you see Paralympic education evolving alongside Olympic education? And, and what do you see the vision for Paralympic education in terms of bringing awareness and diversity and inclusion? It's a really excellent question. Yes, yeah, excellent question. Thank you. Um, um, I earlier said that, uh, uh, sir, um, I earlier said that we have this Olympic Education Commission in the IOC um, and um, Sir Philip Craven for some years was chair of it. And uh, that also, of course, uh, uh, led to uh, very interesting uh, discussions and debates about what is the difference and uh, what do we have in common? What, uh, what is, is there an umbrella term? And uh, is it Olympic education? And uh, I think that um, maybe there are different approaches to it. And I'm not saying that there is one that would fit all. Um, for example, um, every year uh, around the 23rd of June, we're celebrating Olympic Day. Um, we did this year uh, as a digital Olympic Day, and we even made it an Olymp Olympic Digital Week. Um, and we had athletes with disabilities taking part. We had coaches, um, school children, etc. And it's, it's a, the umbrella term is Olympic Day, but it includes also um, Paralympic topics. Um, and that's something where I would rather ask maybe also Eli or others in this group, um, for you, is it for you something that is separate or do you see this as something that can go together very well? And another example, as, a, as I'm the chairperson also of the German Olympic Academy, and uh, when we are producing teaching material uh, about the Olympic movement, we're always including information about Paralympic movement, um, the deaf um, sport uh, activities and deaf Olympics, as well as Special Olympics. So I think um, maybe it's, it's, it's good to have something separate, but I would, again, would rather see this as being an integral part. Um, and we can always discuss um, um, Olympic and Paralympic uh, school days. Maybe it's, it's good to have it separate, but it would also be go good to have some elements of uh, the Paralympic school day be included in Olympic school days and vice versa. Yeah, That's just my, opi no, I, my opinion. Yeah, I'm not saying I this is the way to go. And I think you, perfect in my perspective, I agree 100% that there has to be that interaction, the integration, the feeding off of each other. Uh, and I, I, I think you really spoke to it really well. So thank you, Gudrun. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And Eli, as a Paralympian, how do you identify yourself? 
as relative Olympian, Paralympian? I think I was in the Paralympic Games, but then in terms of being overall within the Olympic movement, the overall umbrella of, of understanding Olympism and, you know, I studied Olympism and Olympic education, but also Paralympic education. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think the way Gudrun spoke to it, indeed. I don't know, uh, David or Mary, are there questions that you've seen that you'd like to touch on or any follow-up? We have a few more minutes. We have about Maybe one time for maybe one more question, perhaps. The one question that we didn't get to is uh, Kirsten Kerwers. Mary, do you want to ask that, or do you? Let's see, Kirsten. I, I have Kirsten's question in front of me, so I'll go ahead with it. Uh, so this is from Kirsten Kerr. Kerr? Kerwer, who's a, who's a okay. student at the Which University is? of Alberta, um, okay. studying adaptive physical activity, and also has a background in sledge hockey. Ah, oh, I'm going to write her name down, too. All right. <laughs> um, so the question it's reads, like community meeting. <laughs> I love this. This is awesome. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Dolzepper, you have talked about increasing diversity and equity within boards. What would be your advice to those who may be on a board and experiencing burnout or resistance to calls for more diversity among the board? Further, as to in how to acknowledge and address tokenism on boards. So a couple of questions in there. So burnout, um, but also tokenism. How much time do we have that I can talk about burnout on boards? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I, um, I have always been, and I would, that would be also kind of an advice, but I would be careful in kind of giving advice to other people. But I think it's important to, to not fight alone. Um, fighting spirit doesn't mean that I have to be the lonely fighter, uh, but I have to be in contact and, and, and exchange uh, with other members uh, on boards or in the organization or in the administration. Um, I think um, I've uh, had in, in, in German sport organization a long time the discussion we need more women on boards um, and they talked about um, women who had the knowledge to be there or just women women. They should be there because they are women. And uh, this has been a long, long debate. Um, I would say we have overcome that. Uh, I would say that uh, women today, at least in the organization that I'm part of, um, they, um, um, they uh, are being there because they have the expertise, they have the, the knowledge and they have also uh, maybe um, the resilience um, and, and I think resilience is maybe is a very important word in this context because um, if I have that impression that I am fighting here uh, just by myself and the, the whole other board members are having a different opinion um, and I know, I know what I'm talking about because I have been in such situations very, very often. But um, then it's really the question, how important is it for you? And we have been doing interviews with women. We've also done, of course, with men. And some of them said, in particular, when it's an elected position, I give up. I, I don't do that anymore. Um, too much fighting, it takes too much energy from me. Um, I have family life, I have my work, and I'm not going to these board meetings where I'm always kind of the loser. Um, and if this situation really exists, then I would say either you find others who will fight with you and stay, or if you are just by yourself, then obviously this is not the right group for you, then leave. I have left groups where I felt that there was no development. I'm leaving. And currently I'm in situations where I have to, we have not touched upon that, but um, sport doesn't stand by itself, but sport is connected to science, is education, is culture. And uh, sometimes you have people in leadership positions who do not, not see this combination, who do not see the connection. Uh, I've been to a minister, federal minister uh, in education in Germany some years ago, and we wanted to talk to her about sport and education. And she said, do you see any connection between sport and education? What can you say? 
if this is your perspective, maybe you are not the right person in that position, but okay. As, uh, I mean, resilience, yes, resilience. And really, I, I strongly believe in teamwork. I strongly believe in connecting to other people and not um, going back from a meeting and, and crying into your pillow. I'm, I'm not doing that. But I would also be ready to leave if this body is not kind of on the same wave like I am. Well, thank you for answering the, the questions that have come in. David, I think time for a wrap up, is it? Yeah, and I have the unenviable position of having to let Lisa Olenek Dornan, my PhD uh, fellow student and someone Gudrun that you know very well. I have Absolutely. To sort of, we don't have time Eddie. for a question. Uh, I touched Lisa. on it a little bit earlier, but yeah, it's a great question, of course. Yeah. Lisa, I'm sorry. I'm sorry we're not able to address this one today. Um, to all of our attendees, uh, thank you for attending. Uh, Eli and Mary, it's been great to work with you, and a special thank you to you, uh, Professor Dr. Dole Tepper Goodrin. Thank you so much uh, for making time for us today and uh, chatting and, and updating us on what you're doing and just providing some fantastic perspective. Um, and advice. We very much appreciate it. This has been a great uh, fifth Sedward Talks. Fourth, fifth, fourth or fifth? Fourth. Fourth Sedward Talks. Um, as, uh, just as an update, we're going to take uh, the rest of July and August off, um, and then we're going to come back in September, and uh, Eli and Mary and I have already talked about some topics. We don't have anything uh, hammered out yet, so we don't have any particular dates, so stay tuned um, to your online portals, and we'll certainly be uh, communicating um, the next sessions that will start up uh, in September or October. So without further ado, happy Monday, uh, everyone. Have a great week. Uh, thank you again to Gudrun, and we look forward to chatting again in September. Gudrun, you have one final statement you want to make? Yes, please. Yes, yes. I, I just wanted to thank you all, and uh, in, in particular, of course, this group who um, put forward questions. Maybe not every question was answered, uh, uh, in, in detail. So I would like to invite you to send me an email. You're always, I'm always happy and you're welcome to send your questions or any, any interested uh, topics that you want to share with me. Go ahead, write me an email and I'm, uh, I will follow up within, let's say, one day. Okay? Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye from Berlin. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah, right. Thank you. Bye. I'm going to close Thank out. Thank you too. Bye. Thank yeah. you. All. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>